thank you all so much uh, for coming to our session. We are not going to help the diversity issues uh, today, our panel. Um, we apologize for that. Um, but yes, but thank you for coming to what could be, and I think perhaps many of you suspected might be a relatively dry session here or wonder what airports really have to do with cities. Airports are, of course, one of the longest, most harmfully neglected pieces of infrastructure in cities, and yet, as the show of hands uh, uh, underscores, the fact that you know, without DFW, we would probably not be here. I imagine, I, I actually know from talking to Matthew that, that having DFW and having American Airlines and having a central hub was actually a critical role in, uh, in the decision to have it here in Dallas, among many other factors. Um, and that many of the companies, when they choose to relocate, Global for Fortune 500 corporations choose uh, major air hubs. In the case of DFW, for example, ExxonMobil and Kimberly Clark have their headquarters in the shadow of the airport. Um, so our session here, we're going to talk briefly uh, with Sean Donahue, who is the CEO of Dallas-Fort Worth Airport, uh, and Mike Boyd of the Boyd Aviation Group, um, to really sort of talk about uh, the importance uh, of basically of, of air hubs in sort of the global city system, uh, and really sort of, you know, the economic role that they play in cities, um, and particularly why, you know, we have to think about this, cities should be thinking about this because even though that, you know, if you look at the top line picture, today is perhaps the greatest day in the history of the aviation business, and tomorrow will be the next greatest day. Globally, traffic has never been higher, uh, and if you look at the last four years of economic performance, these have been the most profitable years in the American Airlines, uh, not just American, but also Delta, United, Southwest, and their history, um, partly because they are, in fact, nickel, di nickel and diming us to death with baggage fees and others, but that's neither here nor there. Um, but, as we're going to talk a bit about, you know, the system gets a bit murkier and a bit spikier when we start delving into uh, where traffic is headed and, and the importance of having global air hubs to connect to the great cities of the global south and, uh, and of Northeast Asia, and particularly the role that they play uh, in American cities and beyond. And so, uh, with that, just a further introduction, Sean, uh, in addition to being CEO of DFW, was also at United Airlines for 25 years and was the COO of Virgin Australia. Uh, for the last three years before joining the airport, so he has a great perspective uh, on both the airlines and international aviation. Uh, and then Mike uh, is one of the longest running sort of uh, consultants and particular commentators uh, when it comes to aviation. Uh, anybody who's ever written about the business knows that if you need an incendiary quote, you call Mike. Um, <laughs> and he has hometown ties as well. He was at Braniff Airlines uh, back in the 70s, if you remember the Mary Quant, uh, Mary Quant years and the beautiful graphics. And so he remembers the system uh, of the true jet age. Um, so with that, I want to dive into the first question for you, Mike. Um, and that is, you know, I, I think it's interesting that, you know, that if you basically look at the system today, if you look at the FAA, uh, when they draw out their projections, they draw straight lines of eternal growth, um, which you think are A, false, uh, and B, there's an assumption that, you know, that a rising tide is lifting all boats, that all cities are getting more air service, when in fact the opposite is happening. We're seeing more and more consolidation into fewer hubs as well as fewer airlines. And so I was hoping you could really sort of debunk some of these myths that, that, that are being propagated right now. Well, the economics of air transportation have changed dramatically because it's more and more expensive to move people and goods by air because of fuel and other things. A lot of, a lot of air service we used to have years ago, like there used to be service between Beaumont and Austin, never again. The economics just aren't there anymore. So the real issue for communities is are you connected to the rest of the world? Or more importantly, like we tell our clients, are you connected from the rest of the world? Can Mr. Jung get here from Shanghai? That's the name, number one issue. So yeah, it is consolidating, but that doesn't mean that communities are losing air service access. They might not have it at Muskegon, but they got it 40 minutes away at Grand, Grand Rapids. Those are the kind of things we have to sort of live with, but the real issue is, are you connected from the rest of the world? Well, just a quick, quick follow-up to that. What does that mean for smaller communities? I mean, you know, we, I mean, we talk about urbanization rates in these settings, and we talk about the fact that you know, more and more Americans are moving into denser urban areas. Is this really hurting rural America, then? Are we seeing the sort of rural America and smaller cities being cut off from the Real rest of the rural world? America, you know, like eastern Montana, western Kansas, places like that. Yeah, you're going to be cut off. I mean, nobody's going to get on a single-engine airplane and fly from Great Bend to Wichita. It ain't happening. I don't care how much money is thrown at it. But in most areas of the world, the consolidation won't hurt anybody. Like, for example, I use Muskegon, Michigan. It used to have 80,000 passengers 20 years ago. They have 80,000 passengers today. They drive 40 minutes away. You remember, you know, Paris, Texas used to have air service. They have great air service now. It's called DFW. So that's the kind of thing you have to recognize. Well, that's a good segue. So, so Sean, I mean, uh, DFW is interesting. It has one of the, it is the busiest airport in the world by operations. 
uh, which means that it flies a lot of small planes to a lot of small destinations, because DFW also has 200. So I was hoping you could talk a bit about the role that DFW plays in this sort of region. I mean, it is, uh, you, you heard Mayor Rawlings this morning, you know, uh, mention the fact that, you know, that Dallas is the, I believe, fifth, I can't remember if you said fourth or fifth largest, you know, metropolitan region in America. Uh, it, it's the largest that's nowhere near a large body of water for a reason. It's because, A, the rail, rail lines created it. But the reason DFW exists, the region, is because of the airport. In 1973, when they built DFW, that's when Fort Worth and Dallas started growing together. And now we're seeing it in a sort of sense that way, too, with the sort of connectivity of these smaller cities. So what role does Dallas-Fort Worth play, the airport play, in both the Metroplex and then also in sort of the Texas regional economy? Sure, sure. Well, you know, to the credit of the forefathers from Dallas and Fort Worth 40 years ago, they identified 17,000 acres that was equidistant to both cities. And so we're the largest capacity airport in the world. No other airport has seven runways like we do. And when you look at the, the economic impact of the airport, it's worth about $31 billion a year to the economy. It's worth about 150,000 jobs, $9 billion in payroll. So it's a massive economic engine for, for the region. Um, and if you look at really our focus over the last couple of years, it's been on growing the international service to the area. And uh, DFW was the fastest growing uh, U.S. gateway last year at double the rate of any other U.S. airport at about 11 percent. And, and why is that important? Um, we just started service last week for the first time to China. So we've got service on American to Shanghai and also Hong Kong. The Shanghai trip is worth $200 million a year in economic uh, value to the region. So we really, you know, from an airport perspective, sometimes we get caught into looking at the operations of the airport and things like that. But uh, we take seriously the, the responsibility in terms of the economic vitality of the airport to the region. Interesting. I, you mentioned, you mentioned the China flight. Um, you know, one of the things that's most interesting to me, Mike, I was hoping you could talk a bit about this. Um, is how you can really see, you know, the rewiring of the global economy and the, and the global south-south trade through aviation. Dubai, the rise of Dubai and the Middle East hubs, uh, and we've seen the rise of Chinese carriers. Um, you know, how many global hubs do you think there are going to be in the future? I mean, what are, what are going to be the real winners here, and, and, and how do cities capitalize on these sort of new flows? I mean, Europe, European cities and airports are very worried that the Gulf carriers, for example, are going to steal their traffic and steal their connections to China and places like that. Do they have a right to be worried? I think to some degree. We call them global portals. DFW is going to be a global portal. Uh, other airports could be, depending upon the carriers they have. But um, I'm not a big believer that this growth in the Middle East is going to continue. We do a lot of fleet forecasting, and traditionally, where airplane demand, you do it by region. You can't do that anymore because, you know, where does Emirates fly? Everywhere. Because there's not a whole lot in, in the Emirates. They're going everywhere. But I think, yeah, it is something to consider. The real issue for most communities is, are you connected to a global hub? I mean, let's face it. I mean, uh, a place like Corpus Christi is never going to have nonstop service to, to, to Dallas. I mean, not to Dallas, but to, say, London. But it is connected to DFW. And with these new airplanes coming in, we'll see some additional nonstop service to European hubs like we saw in Austin. But overall, the real issue is not whether you have air service at your local airport, but whether or not Mr. John can get here without too much brain damage from Shanghai. That's the number one metric. And most communities meet that metric. Well, this is, you talk, we were talking last night a bit about this, about how that sort of plays out. Like the fact that so many Chinese firms, for example, are investing in southeastern United States um, or other sort of connections like that. Um, you know, are there any other examples that come to mind about how global air patterns can change investment patterns and change the, sh the, the focus of cities that way? Well, I mean, you go back, take a look at DFW. You know, Braniff was a visionary. When they opened London in 1978, that's a stupid thing to do. No one's going to fly from London to Dallas. Dumb, dumb, dumb. All right, what do we have now? When they're the first through flights to Asia, not going to work. Well, what do we have now? Shanghai, we have Hong Kong, we're going to have other cities. So the real issue is looking forward to saying what you can do with the new technologies that are out there. But again, the issue is it's, there's not going to be any more hubs opened up. Mm -hmm. The ones that are here now are the ones that are in place, like DFW, Atlanta, even Detroit. Those are places where the locus of con connectivity is going to be. And you know, Greg, it's, it's also about city to city competition. Um, about three months ago, I was asked to give a briefing. It was rather unique. I've never done this in my career. Um, I was told there was going to be about 12 people coming out to the airport. I was supposed to give them a briefing on 
you know, the, the value of the airport, the service, uh, the, the strategy and the focus, but I was told I couldn't know who was in the room. So here's 12 people. I come in, I give them a briefing about DFW Airport. They ask lots of questions, and then a month later, Toyota North, North America announces that they're relocating from California to, to the DFW area. And that was the group I spoke to. And, uh, you know, that's 4,000 well-paying jobs. And their, their CEO, when they made the decision, said DFW Airport was one of the top reasons they, they decided to come down. So it's, it's the connectivity, but it's also, also the competition. I mean, we're, you know, globally we're very competitive, but even within the U.S. we're very competitive from a city-to-city -city perspective. Well, given this is a cities conference, Sean, uh, my question is, you know, how, do, how can we make airports more urbane or better integrate them into the urban cores? So I don't know if you've seen, there's a great image that's going around out online I saw where uh, someone took photographs of the same scale of the core of Florence and a single highway interchange in Atlanta. And they were the same size. And we heard this morning, of course, that DFW is the size of all of Manhattan. Sure. So you know, how, do we do, how can we do a better job of actually integrating into the core? I have a friend here, Aaron Wren, who writes under the Urbanophile blog. He gamely took from the airport uh, the DART, and it took him two shuttle buses to get to the DART train station at DFW. Um, you know, uh, what, what strategies can airports do, and, and you know, should we be investing more in high-speed rail or just rail in general? You know, what are the tricks? How, how, how can cities do that? Because in New York, for example, we're still waiting for a single seat from the, you know, from the plane to, to, uh, to Grand sure. Central. Sure. No, it's, it's a fair question. DART, just for all of you and the audience, is the, the Dallas uh, light rail service. And then for Fort Worth, it's called the, the T. Um, we have DART opening service to the airport in August. So it'll be the first time we've had light rail service. And we're working with Fort Worth to bring the T in. Uh, in a couple of years, and every world-class airport in the world has to have that intermodal, that type of connection, and, and that type of service. The other aspect, and again, we're, we're fortunate at, at, at DFW, is we have about 6,000 acres for commercial development. So we, we also have a strategy of what makes the best sense as we look at commercial development on the airport. Um, it needs to make sense for Dallas, it needs to make sense for Fort Worth and the community. Um, that is one area where we don't compete. You, you know, we work together with all the stakeholders and that's why you see a lot of logistics centers, you see aircraft part uh, logistics centers at the airport. What makes the most sense for the entire community when it comes to commercial development? Yeah. Mike, I want to come back to touch upon the airlines briefly for this, because one of the things I've seen, one of the things that American cities have struggled with, this is, I think, perhaps less of an issue overseas, but definitely in American context, where we've seen cities like St. Louis and Memphis and Cincinnati lose their hubs and start dropping out of you know, the global city ranks, starting losing, losing their access to the world in a major way. Um, you know, how, do you, how do you talk to the airlines? Is there a way to convince them to stay or continue service, or is this a Darwinian sort of winnowing that's going to happen with cities in the United States and, and other developed well, economies. Yeah, I, I think to get Delta back into Cincinnati would be great. You could go and convince them they can continue to lose more money. As simple as that. Um, the reality is uh, Cincinnati, by the way, has great air service, outstanding air service. But many of the communities that were routes that were supported by the connecting hub can't be supported anymore. That's bottom line. Pittsburgh's seen it. Memphis is seeing it. It's reality. But if you want to get almost any place in the world from Cincinnati, you can do it today either nonstop or one stop. But the days of being able to get on a nonstop flight and fly from Cincinnati, say, to Tucson, over. No airline can do it. There's not enough traffic to make it work. But those communities still have great air service. They just got to realize their role has changed. And that's all there is to it. Well, in an overseas context, I, you know, I'll come back to this in a second with you as well, Sean. You know, we were discussing that DFW, for example, is perfectly situated for Northeast Asia and Latin America, you know, huge rising trade, trade routes, and that, you know, that potentially DFW could become the hub. Um, or it could be Panama, or it could be Houston. I, my question is, you know, is there a race on in many of these major trade lanes to become that airport? The Middle East hubs are all battling for each other to be the one true hub. Um, is that a ruinous struggle, or is that a, a, a proper struggle, given that we're going to have a final shakeout, and it'll be, it'll be like Highlander in the movie? I don't think it'll be a shakeout. The fact is DFW is in the right spot. Draw a line from Buenos Aires, to, or better yet, Sao Paulo, to Tokyo, and look what you have to fly over. You know, you're gumming up the skies over Dallas. So in, in terms of a place that can connect people on both sides, Chinese carriers are going to need to get to, to Latin America. 
They can't do it nonstop because they have to go over the South Pole to do it. But they can come here, interconnect with American Airlines, and carry pa passengers all the way through. DFW is in the right spot at the right time with the economy. Detroit could be, but the economy there just doesn't make it happen. So you're in the right spot at the right time. Well, we, we, we are. You know, facilitation plays a big part in this mm -hmm. in terms of the flow of connecting traffic. And um, for those of you who, who traveled into the U.S. last year from an international destina destination, it was pretty painful, no matter what gateway it was. Um, and we, you know, working with Customs and Border Patrol, we have to improve the facilitation. We have to improve how we welcome guests into this country. And, you know, we're, we're fortunate. We, through the use of technology, we're now clearing international trips at DFW through Customs and Immigrations in 15 to 20 minutes. And we think that's something that can, you know, accelerate this tremendous opportunity of traffic moving between Asia and South America. And, and you know, American Airlines is a, is a partner with us on that, and we're going to continue to see if we can move that forward. I was thinking, as you're not the major gateway between China and Latin America right now, that would be Vancouver, where I can actually transit, and where mm -hmm. there is, you know, the, uh, the massive amount of real estate injection. Uh, well, this is a quick, quick reminder that we're going to happily start taking questions from the audience if we have any questions already or if anyone would like to start uh, asking them. Um, otherwise, you know, I'm particularly interested in, you know, how do you go about, how does the city go about actually attracting more international carriers into this? This is, this is the classic thing. Mike, you get hired for this all the time and you, f and, and you feel that you have many, many cities asking you hopelessly for more air service. And then I imagine many large hubs are constantly figuring out how do we get the Chinese carriers in? How do we get Korean in? Um, so, you know, what would, be, what would your advice be? How do you actually go out and prove and say that we are a global city and we deserve global air service? Well, and I, I kind of wear both hats. I wear my old airline hat and, and I wear my current hat. Airlines are making investment decisions. And when you are flying a couple of 777s a day between Dallas and Shanghai or an A380 between here and Dubai, you, you are investing a lot of money into this route. And and it has to be sustainable. We, you know, we work with carriers to incentivize them in the first couple of years, and, and we think that's a great return on investment. But again, I, I go back to the community, I go back to all the stakeholders in this area. You know, you've got to make sure you support these services. They have to be sustainable, because an airline is not going to lose money for, for several years when they can put that 777 or A380 in a different market. Um, there's no God-given rights here. So, it's we help attract with, with incentives. Uh, we go out and we educate and we instigate. Uh, but, you know, we also work with, again, all the, the partners in the community to make sure the, the services are successful. Mike, you were saying you weren't a big believer in the, in the Gulf Airlines, which I disagree with you on personally, at least in the case of Dubai and, and Emirates. Um, but I was curious, you know, what, what do you think will be the great mega hubs of, of the 21st century? If you had to pick a top five that you think are the combination of policy, location, carrier, uh, what would those cities be? Well, if we change our consular policy, DFW, mm -hmm. as well as a couple other, other places I won't mention, because Sean will hit me. <laughs> um, but see, the, the problem I have with, with the Middle East, yeah, Dubai's great and all that, Qatar, Qatar. The problem there, though, there's no local traffic. Not no, but there's very low local traffic. Mm -hmm. And DFW or Atlanta or Detroit can aggregate a whole lot of traffic from a very powerful nation to support that nonstop service. Emirates can't. Yeah. So I think, you know, and again, they have a lot of hard iron, a lot of airplanes on order. I'm questioning with, well, who was it? Just can't, Emirates just canceled an order for 70 airplanes. I don't think that was because of a fuel burn. I think they were looking and saying, I don't think we're going to need these suckers. So I think going forward, I think it's going to be the U.S. Charles de Gaulle is another place. It certainly is in the right spot at the right time, but it may have expense issues. Any questions in the audience? Anything? Anything? I see a hand. I see a couple hands popping up here. Please take a microphone to them. Hello, uh, John Coleman from Ford Motor Company. Uh, I'm interested in what actions you might be taking to mitigate the carbon footprint of airports because that's becoming a bigger and bigger issue in cities, especially where there are EPA non-attainment concerns. Yeah, very good question. Uh, obviously, the, the single biggest driver is, uh, is the fuel emissions from the airplanes, but from an airport perspective, uh, our focus is on the central power plant and central utilities. And uh, we've actually, 
we look at it from two perspectives. Number one, um, how can we reduce the carbon footprint, which we are doing with some smarter technologies in, in terms of, of, of our central power plant. But the good news is it's also cheaper. So while our carbon footprint has gone down, we've also seen our costs go down. And uh, the, the other issue that's big for an airport, and you wouldn't think it's that big in DFW, but it sure was this past winter, um, is glycol. And you know, how you, how you capture the glycol that is yes, you know, thousands and thousands of gallons on each airplane. Um, and, and we've got a very good program where we capture that and we work with the, the local water districts so that we don't have any issues there. But that, sometimes glycol isn't, isn't focused enough on because that can be very, very damaging from an environmental standpoint. Another question, please. From Esther. Um, hi. So this may be well known to people in the business. It's probably not as well known to the public. But the return on investment for doing things like global entry, uh, simply fixing the customs incoming line, it would be great if that could be made more public and shared with airports around the world. I know there are political issues and employment issues, but it seems like that's one of the most foolish constraints on economic development, and somehow the, the people in charge don't seem to understand the economics of it. Yeah, just to dinner that, how do we lobby for that? I mean, you're obviously constrained. I can't imagine you can talk that much back to the FAA, but how should we, as citizens, uh, actually lobby in favor of that and communicate that? Well, if your question is specifically about facilitation through customs and immigration, is that, was that your question, or FAA? Right. Well, you know, when it comes to facilitation, technology is clearly the answer. I mean, we, we will have at DFW by the end of the month 60 uh, passport control kiosks. And if you are a U.S. citizen or you're from a visa waiver country, you will not see a, an immigrations officer. You will use that technology, you will go down, you'll collect your bag, you'll go through the customs, and you'll, and you'll leave. We just rolled out last week. And again, this is in partnership with the Customs and Border Patrol. If you don't have a checked bag, use the kiosk, you leave the hall. You don't even go downstairs to Customs. So, you know, working with, with Customs and Border Control, I mean, there's just no doubt there, there's a positive return on that investment. The carriers, you know, we've got Qantas and Emirates who are bringing A380s into DFW in a couple months. Candidly, I'm not sure they would have done that if we didn't have the ability to handle that increased load on the, on the airplane. From an FAA standpoint, Greg, clearly next gen, you know, we've spoke about it for a decade in this industry. We're starting to see some progress, um, but we've got to make sure that the satellite-based technology is where we're gonna invest, uh, invest for the future. Okay. Other questions? We have a hand here in the center. What are the chances of something like an Uber or Lyft? I, do you mean the sense of sort of air taxis? Yeah. Um, Mike, do you want to handle this? I mean, this has been, this the been proposed and tried. The economics smooth do not work. I mean, and also people won't get on it. I mean, like I mentioned Great Bend, Kansas. I mean, no one's going to fly in from Manchester, England, you know, connect to DFW, connect then to Wichita, and then get on a single engine airplane. People don't like that kind of brain damage. So for most small communities, air transportation no longer can serve as many missions as it did 30 years ago. The economics just aren't there, and people won't get on it. We've got to recognize that and look at other things. And one of those other things is going to be the automobile. Simple as that. Just as an addendum to that, there are attempts to try to change that model. I mean, air taxis were floated seven or eight years ago, and there's a new airline called Surfair that is trying to basically be the Netflix model for air travel. Um, but they're so new, it's impossible to tell whether it'll take off, so to speak. Um, any other questions? I think we have time for one or two more, if there are any out there. Anything? 
All right, well, Mike, I want to have one final question on this is, which is, you know, what do you think, sort of, what is, what is, do you think going to be the shape of the aviation system in another 10 years out? I mean, if you, look at, if you look at the very long run, we've seen an unstoppable rise in number of passengers through any number of crises of the last 30 or 40 years and oil shocks and everything else. Uh, do you think, you know, do you think that another, sh another rise in oil prices, let's say to $150 a barrel, could potentially kill aviation or $200 a barrel. We already know that the economics aren't making that much sense anymore. So what's the biggest existential threat? Just oil prices? Yeah, well, oil, oil prices won't kill it. It will certainly limit again the number of missions that an airplane can do to carry people and goods around the, around the world. That's as simple as that. And that's, that can happen. So we have to look at other, other ways of, you know, even I have tumbled to Skype. And I think Skype looks like a hostage video, but it's better than getting on an airplane. So. Um, <laughs> So those are the kind of things that are going to start to happen as we go forward, but more communication will be there, and, and other forms will fit. I use this example. 30 years ago, there were about 40,000 people that flew between Albany, New York, and Boston. Today, there's probably not 1,000. There's no service. So we adjust to those things, and we're going to continue to adjust. Well, this is a follow-up addend up to that, Sean, so you must know this too, uh, and, and your thoughts on sort of the role of technology in this. I, I had the fortune a couple years ago of listening to Doug Parker, the new CEO of American Airlines, tell a room of frequent flyers, essentially, that the American system would consolidate into four or five airlines and that they would basically run a quasi-cartel and that they would continue to charge for check baggage fees and, and late and fees and cancellation fees. And it would be like a, you know, it'd be like a seat smashing into your face forever and ever and ever, and it would be incredibly profitable. Um, could technology disrupt the airline business? Could we see a dramatic fall off in this? Uh, you know, if we continue to run a system that's lowest common denominator, to say the least. Well, if you're going to uh, the customer experience, and, and maybe you weren't going that way, but I, I think the battle for at least the U.S. carriers moving forward, because financially they're in, they're in quite good shape. As Mike said, they're in the best shape they've been in a long time. And you see some of the investments they're making. Um, you know, one could make the argument that the customer experience will be the next battleground. And whoever can, can solve that, I, I think, could really see, see a leap forward. And, you know, having spent the last three years in Australia, you know, there's quite a few duopolies in Australia. And, and they, uh, they work pretty well, but they also get the customer experience right. And, uh, you, you know, you look at the airlines and you look at their focus, and if, if someone can get that piece of it right, and, they, and I'm not saying they're doing it wrong, but if they can take it to the next level, that could be a huge differentiator. It's something we're focused on, I can tell you, from an airport perspective. Well, so perhaps there's a slim ray of hope for when we all convene next year in whatever city we convene in. Uh, may I have a round of applause for our panelists? Thank you so much. Thank you.